One day he's in his kitchen. His daughter, about seven years old, comes up to him, says, Daddy, what's sex? He's like, that's a little earlier than I thought it was going to be. Seven years old, really? All right, well, have a seat. They sit down in the kitchen. He looks at his seven-year-old daughter, begins to explain birds and the bees, boy parts and girl parts. He uses a couple analogies, throws in a couple scriptures, things he remembers from back in, back in the maybe a good sermon he heard in church about sex, uh, maybe Sunday school, maybe something he learned along the way. And he finishes up, and his daughter's sort of looking at him like, it's a little kind of fire hosed, not quite sure what happened. He's like, you yeah, know, did a pretty good job, I think. Not too bad, threw some scripture in there. I think that had to have made sense to her. Honey, what do you think? She looks back, she says, Daddy. I'm not sure I understand really anything of what you just said. I'm not even sure what we're talking about. But I came in and mommy was making dinner and I said, I'm really hungry. When dinner is going to be ready? And mommy said in a couple sex. So I was just, what's sex? <laughs> At some point, though, she will ask that question of her dad. Pink life, someday is going to ask Kent. And that little girl, right, seven years old, someday... She's going to learn what it is, and she's going to enter the dating pool, and she's going to begin to date. She's probably going to have a couple close calls with love, maybe even a couple heartbreaks, and then she's going to really grow in to dating at some point in her life, and then at some point, she's going to become either a positive or a negative statistic, and the statistics today are a lot worse than they were 50 years ago. In 1960, the divorce rate was about 25%. Now it's about double. In 1960, cohabitation didn't even register as a percentage point. Now, most estimates are that almost 25% of adults cohabitate. And that doesn't even include the ones who used to or will in the future. And premarital sex was somewhere around 25%. And now the estimates are much, much Higher. I could go through many statistics, right? Statistics about premarital sex, divorce, lust, pornography, lack of purity, number of sexual partners, what we see on TV, what makes an R movie today versus what made an R movie 20 years ago. We could do this all day, but you get my point. There's a problem when it comes to marriage and sex, and pornography, and lust. And by sex, I mean premarital and extramarital. How's that for an elephant in the room? It's actually like a herd of elephants. <laughs> now, all week, the past couple weeks, actually, I've been getting all these kinds of messages because people knew I was going to be the closer in the series. I was getting Facebook and, and tweets and texts and notes, and I'd run into people in restaurants and grocery stores like, I know what you're talking about. You know what 90% 90, 90 of the people guessed? Somebody today opened up your version, and you thought, probably thought the same thing. Most people have guessed that this weekend we're going to talk about homosexuality. You would be incorrect. You see, homosexuality something that our pastoral team is actually facing on a regular basis. It's something that we are sitting down face to face and talking about with people from our church. People that are either struggling with it themselves or they have a family member or a friend who is deeply struggling with it. And they're looking for pastoral guidance. And we're talking to them, we're listening to them, 
We're seeing the tears. We're reasoning with them. We're giving them gospel-driven answers to questions they've probably only articulated for the first time. And we're doing it through grace and compassion. And I don't believe any sermon given today will be able to do a better job of ministering to those people than what we're already doing across the table. Homosexuality, we believe, is something that's best for a pastoral setting, not a platform. And so we're not talking about it today. And frankly, the amount of meetings we're having with people where we're talking about that is much less, much less than the amount of meetings that we're having talking with people about premarital, extramarital sex, lust, pornography, and their marriages. So those are what we're going to address today. That's the herd of elephants. So let me pray. Father, we come before you today. We believe you are our ultimate authority. We believe that your scriptures give us clear revelation, clear biblical truth that apply to all times and to all peoples. And so today, would you open them up for us? Teach us your ways on this matter. In Jesus' name, amen. From the beginning, sex has been God's idea. Do you know that? Right in the beginning, Genesis 2, Adam and Eve were created. You know the first communication between two human beings is between Adam and Eve. They're naked in the presence of God, and it can only be described as a love poem. It is. It's a love poem between a naked husband and his wife. And the scriptures go on and on. It's clear that sex is a part of God's design. Proverbs, where I'm going to spend a bit of my time in Proverbs 5. There is actually a verse in Proverbs 5 that in the original Hebrew could literally be translated, a husband should be ravaged by his wife's breasts. It's pretty straightforward, right? Some people say, Pastor Doug, do you really believe in the literal interpretation and application of the Bible? Well, sometimes it has its advantages. <laughs> Come on, that was funny. <laughs> There's a context, though, to this. We'll get to the saucy stuff in a couple sex. <laughs> this passage in Proverbs is discussing the importance of staying with your spouse before you meet them. And after you meet them. It says this beginning in verse 8. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. This is talking about someone else who is not your spouse. Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take the fill of your strength and the laborers go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and your body are consumed. God tells us stay away from sex with someone who is not your spouse because it will consume you, and it will overtake you, and it has clear consequences in your life. God says, do whatever it takes to avoid temptation. Don't even get close. Don't flirt with disaster. Don't pretend like it's okay. Don't rationalize it. Do whatever it takes. Be as different, as radical, as weird as you need to be. Get away from it. You know, that in Proverbs, it's echoed throughout most clearly in the New Testament. Paul says this, flee from sexual immorality. And then he gives us some theological reasons why. God's response to sexual immorality is clear. Run, Forrest, run, and don't stop. The picture from Proverbs that we get is that when we don't flee, our body becomes impure on the inside. And that eventually that works its way to the outside and we are consumed with our impurity. What stays on the inside eventually comes out. If you're familiar with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, there's a character that Tolkien gives us. He's often known as Gollum, but he began as Smeagol. Smeagol was an ordinary hobbit. He looked pretty normal. But this ring, his precious, corrupted him. And he eventually becomes the character Gollum, a grotesque to look at. He stays in the shadows. Tolkien said it was a description of, and I quote, a visible soul. Sometimes things come inside of us and they hang out there. And we can keep them hidden for a while, but eventually they consume us. 
Proverbs says, unless we flee. Paul later in Ephesians doesn't say don't just flee. and He doesn't say just from anything. Listen to this. He says flee, but then this. But among you, Ephesians 5, there must not even be a what? A hint of sexual immorality. You want to remember two words about what we're supposed to do, married, unmarried. We are supposed to flee from a hint. Say flee with me. Flee. Say hint. Hint. Flee from a hint. Unfortunately, the norm today is that we don't necessarily flee from a hint. We actually tiptoe to a line. And let's be honest, that line is always shifting in the sand and it's always up for discussion. I would argue today that most people's lines don't resemble at all the lines we see in the scriptures. The scripture tells us is sexual immorality. We somehow ignore God's warnings in the Proverbs and Corinthians and we paint a picture for our own lives that's going to come out of us one day where our soul will be golemized, if you will. We trade God's design for something else. And often we don't recognize it until it's too late. Tolkien's buddy Lewis talked about this in a different way. He said, we're half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition. When infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. When it comes to sex, this is true. Married or single, we have become far too easily pleased by settling for less than God's design. We're playing in the mud, and we don't understand the amazing holiday along a sea that he has for us. I can see the faces. I've been preaching long enough. I see the stares. I see the looks. Even through the screen, I see you. I know what you're thinking. Man, this guy is out of touch. He doesn't know what's going on. I understand. I know this is completely countercultural. I know what I'm doing, though. I know exactly what I'm doing. And I know how difficult this is to listen to. But that was just the first point. Here comes the good stuff in the proverb Scripture is not just a list of don'ts, it's not just don't play in the mud. Scripture is a list of do's. It's a description of the holiday at the sea, how to get there, and what to do when you get there. Scripture tells us what the holiday is. Again, back to Proverbs. says this, Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Underline a word there for you, intoxicated. The Hebrew word intoxicated. It's the word shagah. Can you say that with me? Shagah. As in many languages and cultures, Languages and cultures in the Hebrew, there are these words that pack more meaning than normal. They literally pack a punch. And this one is certainly like that, conveys a huge idea. When used literally, you want to know what shagah means? Yep. And there he goes across the parry, and the poor impala does not see him coming. That's shagah. Shagah was used to talk about a wild animal in pursuit. It's this passion. Literally, in the Hebrew language, it means to be captivated, enraptured, passionately intoxicated, utterly consumed with your spouse. As I've been studying, I've grown to really like this word. Started to use it around the house a little bit, let the blue life know. Daddy's pretty crazy about mommy. She comes down the stairs. I like the vibe she's putting out. I just go, Shaga. <laughs> it works pretty well. Came home the other day, found her coloring with the kindergartner, doing a little potty training with the toddler, a little spit up from the baby on her shoulder. Shaga. 
Go ahead. You're married. Husbands, look to your wife. Give her a little shagah. Go ahead. Come on. Shagah. Shagah is an incredibly important part of God's design. It's this passionate, sexual, emotional, relational, spiritual encounter with one in the context of a covenant. Again, one of these words packs a meaning. God's covenant, using a bit of Tim Keller's stuff here, a covenant, it's a word that we don't use a lot today, right? Maybe in a legal sense we use it, but in God's design, a covenant is a relationship between two people, sometimes between God and humanity, but often between a husband and a wife. It's God's design that encompasses this incredible intimacy, love, self-sacrifice, and commitment together. It's not just legal. It's not just emotional. It's not just sexual. It's all of those things and much, much more. You want to, you want to know what the opposite of a covenant relationship is? A consumer relationship. A consumer relationship. You know, I can remember my first cell phone. A little flip phone. You remember these things? Scott McCabe, our pastor at Swickley Campus, was using one of these like two weeks ago until he upgraded. <laughs> I remember coming home with a flip phone. And it was so cool to be able to make a phone call from your car. It had these options. And I had upgraded from something else. I couldn't find it in my basement. I, I think I gave it away or something. But I, I found this one. I remember being able to, hey, honey, look at this. I can take a picture with this thing and I can send it to you. And, oh, honey, there's these things called text messages. Watch this. I can tell you when I'm coming home. I'll be home in five minutes. Look at that. It was so cool and so new. And I had that thing from about Y2K until Steve Jobs came up with this thing. And I remember when I saw the first iPhone commercial. I was like, oh, upgrade. Got to get one of those. So I take this in. Hey, am I up for a free upgrade? And they're like, yeah, you've had that thing for eight years. Great. I want one of those. And so I brought home my first Apple iPhone, and I loaded up the apps, and I started, you know, oh, man, I was going crazy. I was like, oh, there's GPS on here. That's amazing. You don't need that little window dashboard unit anymore, which some of you still have, which I just don't get. But anyway, that's cool. So there's a GPS thing on there, right? And then I, and then I found the version app. I was like, I can have the Bible in church. I don't have to worry about forgetting my big, hard Bible. So if the lights go out, I can still have my Bible. And I was happy. I had my iTunes on here and everything. And then what happened? New version came out. Mm-hmm. And you know I wanted the new upgrade, right? I wanted that iPhone 4. The camera was better. It was faster. It had more memory. It'd hold more music. This one could play videos real well. It was like shaky. You wouldn't hear half of it. This one, it'd be seamless, right? And then let's just be honest iPhone 4 was sexy, right? I was like, that's a sexy phone. I was like, I got to have that. Got to upgrade. And then another one came out right after I got this one. I, I don't read the tech blogs. I don't know about that kind of stuff. That's why I got it so cheap. But there it comes. And it's got this thing on it called Surrey, a woman talking to you all day, telling you what to do. <laughs> I haven't gotten that upgrade. Been married for almost 12 years. I'm just kidding. Come on. That's the consumer mentality. The problem is we apply it to our relational marriage life. We say, oh boy, that'd be nice. Ooh, look at that option. Hey, honey, may, could we try this? Honey, could we make this change? But you see, that's not God's design. God's design is not a consumer mentality. It's not change to me, meet my needs. It's a covenant. And there's a huge difference. A Christian ethicist who's a professor, Stanley Hauerwas, he talks about this consumer mentality. He says this, destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic. That's another way of saying the consumer mentality that assumes marriage and the family are primarily institutions of personal fulfillment, necessary for us to become whole and happy. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. Come on, that's funny. Always marry the wrong person. We never know whom we marry. 
We just think we do. Or even if we marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, means we are not the same person after we have entered it. The primary challenge of marriage is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. You see, in a consumer relationship, once your partner, married or not, realizes who you are, you can get ditched for an upgrade. If you're in a consumer relationship, you never stop spinning, marketing, selling yourself. Happiness, emotion, those are the drivers. Because the most important of the consumer cycle is what you need in the moment. What do you need? Can I meet that need? And of course, this is where sex comes in. In a consumer relationship, sex is a consumer good. You're doing it out of feeling, and you're keeping your independence. And this robs sex of its meaning and its purpose according to God. It turns sex into marketing at worst and a great feeling at best. In a covenant relationship, though, it's completely different. Keller, again, talks about this. He says sex is a covenant renewal ceremony. It's a moment for a husband and a wife to come together and renew that deep, committed, sacrificial, whole life relationship that they have with one another. That's what sex is in God's design. That when a husband and a wife are naked and vulnerable together, theologically, it's a sign of what they've done with their whole life. In a consumer relationship, you don't have that. Sex is asking someone to do something with their body that they will not do with their life. Physical union without the whole life lacks integrity, no matter how you spin it. God's design for sex is a covenant renewal ceremony, not a consumer product. You must not do with your body what you're not willing to do with your life. This is what the scripture teaches. All right. Little participation, all campuses. We're going to have you raise your hands. I'm going to ask you a question. I just want you to raise your hands. I'm not going to ask you that. I'm not going to ask you that. And I'm definitely not going to ask you that. But I am going to ask you this. If you're married, raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. If you're married, raise your hand, all campuses. Okay? I'm going to come back to you in a couple secs. Put those hands down. Show of hands, all campuses. I'm not going to embarrass you. If you're not married, raise your hands. Come on, put them up. All right, you're not married. Look around the room. Like anything you see? (laughs) Anybody make you go, Chagall? Maybe hit them up in the lobby after the service. Drop a little cheesy Christian line. Hey, I bet you're an ESV kind of girl. (laughs) Sloppy, wet, or unforeseen? Some of you got that. Okay, if you're not married, your hand should not be up still. Put it down and buckle up. Here's the biggest elephant in the herd today. Much of what is a part of today's dating culture is married stuff without the rings. God tells us not a hint. But when you've been doing married stuff, you've had lots of hints. Often with several different people until you find the one that works best. It's consumer extraordinaire. Living together has become a norm And I know for a fact that the way sexual practices are handled more closely resemble not the commands of Scripture, but what feels good in the moment, what makes the other person happy, what keeps them committed to you, and unfortunately what's been learned from watching Schmidt, Joey, Lady Mary Crawley before she married Matthew, and even the Oval Office in the mid-90s. The problem, of course, is simple. When you operate outside of God's definitions and God's design for sex. You are training for divorce all your dating life by pretending to be married in a consumer relationship. You don't build a life of purity on a foundation of sin. Though our culture says sex is glamorous, God tells us it can golemize us. So the best way to have a great marriage tomorrow is to flee today. Some of you, I realize, you're still evaluating the person of Jesus Christ. You're not sure where you stand on the whole Christian thing. You're not sure about the scriptures. Okay? 
I'd love to talk with you about that at some point. But let's set that aside for a moment. I'll give you two examples from the world. Secular examples that have no reference to the scriptures, the ultimate source of truth, and they're stumbling on the truth of God. There was an article in April, in of all places, the New York Times, on the downside of cohabitation. It was actually making the case that people should not live together if they want to have a successful marriage in the future. They interviewed one girl who was cohabitating since broken up. She said this, I felt like I was on an audition to be his wife, but I was never going to win the part. Some of you are stuck in that right now. And that gal's touching on the idea of a consumer relationship. The secular article said this, and I quote, couples who cohabitate before marriage are less satisfied with their marriages and more likely to divorce. These negative outcomes are called the cohabitation effect. You can, without no scriptural support, make a very strong case that if you want to have a miserable marriage and end up in divorce, you should start living together now. According to the New York Times. Second example is a book by two scientists called Premarital Sex in America. Scientific findings that teach us that most people today who are having premarital sex are doing it for one of two reasons, and I would argue they're both consumer reasons. It's a part of the hookup culture or in order to keep a relationship going. It's consumer extraordinaire. Give me what I want or I'm going over there. There's a recent book in a different world written for Christians. It's called Sex, Dating, and Relationships. In it, these authors, theologians, pastors, they give a paradigm-shifting view of sex and dating and relationships. And one of the things I like most about this book is they, they make this argument. I think it's pretty sound. There's only three relationships in the scriptures. There's only three. There's marriage, there's family, and there's neighbor. There's nothing else. And in only one of those, marriage, is there to be sex in God's design. There's no sex in the family, and there's no sex with your neighbor. And so until you're married, you got to say, okay, am I going to treat that person like my sister, like my brother? Am I going to do that with my brother, my sister? You see, God's design, it's deep. And his design is simple. The best way... To have a great marriage tomorrow is to flee today. Scripture tells us this, and as I've argued, culture is beginning to stumble on the truth as well. Stephen Colbert, he, he's a comedian, and uh, you know, he coined this term called truthiness. If you've ever heard this term, truthiness, it's a tendency to accept something as true, not because it has rational support, but rather based on intuition, because it feels good, fits with, confirms our prejudice with regard to evidence, logic, intellectual examination, or facts. Just basically saying, I'm going to make a decision based on truthiness. It feels like it's true to me. Yeah, it's got to be true to me. And so you make a decision based upon that. The scriptures would tell us if we make decisions for our life, particularly in the area of relationships based on truthiness, disaster awaits. It will consume us inside and it will come outside of us eventually. How about three tales from the dating escapades of Northway, Oakland? Just got a little nervous over in Oakland. Don't worry, I'm not showing pictures or using names. But seriously, three highlights. Several months ago, I got together with a guy I'm married, he was dating a gal, and he was struggling through a breakup he had with a gal, and she wasn't really a believer, and they came to a conflict because she wanted him to spend the night, not to have sex, just to spend the night. She knew his boundary said no sex, but when she said, I want you to spend the night, he said, I I can't do that. And she's like, I'm not asking you to have sex with me, I'm asking you to spend the night with me. He's like, "I'm, I'm sorry, my boundary is different. And this ended, this tailed a whole conversation. And they ended up breaking up, and I helped him navigate through that. By the way, that guy's got a killer job. I think he's a pretty good-looking dude, and he's still single. Ladies, drop me a note. <laughs> Not even a hint is his standard. That's strong. Another guy went on a date with a gal from Oakland, and uh, I heard after the fact from several different people there probably wasn't going to be a second date, but get this. She said this to several different people. Yeah, you know, probably not going to be a second date. It wasn't really that chemistry, but I've never felt so valued on a date in my whole life. And you know what? At the end of it, it was the weirdest thing. I felt like I wanted to know Jesus more. 
And I heard that. I was like, can that be the new standard? He's also single. Has a good job, I think. Good looking guy. Drop me a little note. I'll help you out. And there was a couple that I met with. And they wanted me to marry them. And they were living together. They were having sex. And this came up in our first uh, conversation together. And it, it comes up a lot, as I said. And we begin to talk about it, and, and they immediately get defensive. And this goes on for about an hour and a half, and I knew it wasn't going well. Basically talking about a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in a different pastoral way, sort of asking questions across the table, opening scripture, conver- conversing about it. They sent me a couple emails a couple weeks later. They've left the church. I'm not doing the wedding anymore. At- they don't want me to do it. They went and found another pastor who would do their wedding, all because they said... I won't quote them directly, but they said, it feels right to us, God will bless it. Now, of those three situations, which one do you think is headed for disaster? And which ones do you think are probably going to be okay based on God's design for sex and for marriage? See, for non-married folks, you're single, you want to be married someday. The best way to have a great marriage tomorrow, according to God, is to flee today. Come back to the married folks. Guess what? Same line. Best way to have a great marriage tomorrow is to flee today. It's the best way. To run away as fast as we can from things that would pull us out of that covenant relationship and to do everything we can to get the consumer relationship out. If I had time, which I don't, I would, I would tell you about the Christian divorce rate. It's not what you've heard. You often hear the Christian divorce rate. It's the same as the world. Sometimes people even say, it's even higher. Well, that's true when you just ask people, are you a Christian? But do you know that when you drill down in a lot of new studies into that question, and you find out if that person is engaged in church on a regular basis, if they're serving, if they're reading the scriptures, if they're praying together, if they are what would be called serious disciples of Jesus Christ, according to Dr. Bradley Wright and many other studies, the percentage doesn't matter, it's astronomically lower. The point is this, as followers of Jesus Christ, when we are serious about that following, Our marriages get stronger. They don't end the same way as the world because this is how God designed it. Again, I recognize probably some married people in the room and you're saying, hey, okay, you're making some great arguments and, you know, stuff for the single people was cool, but I'm married, you know, and I don't don't know where Jesus is in my life right now and I'm not sure I know what I believe about the scriptures. Okay, let me give you one more secular example. Ran across this. This was in this week's New York Times in the fashion and style section, obviously. Kent Chevalier sent it to me. (laughs) It's entitled, A Room Full of Yearning and Regret. It's written by a woman who's undergone two things in her life, significant things. She has had an affair, and in a different relationship, she was the victim of an affair. Both sides. This is in the New York Times. She makes no mention of her faith, so I don't know. I don't make any assumptions about that. But the woman writing clearly is peeling back the veneer and the allure of sex outside of marriage and revealing the pain and the loneliness as she was a part of two different affairs, one she was in and one she was a victim of. This is clearly what Proverbs is talking about. That there's this golemization that happens. We end up playing with mud pies in a slum, not understanding what is meant by a holiday at the sea. And her last lines, honestly, almost brought me to tears from her experience. As she clearly explains, not using our categories, that she longs for a covenant type of marriage, not a consumer one. Listen to her own words. She says this, if you were 75, which would you rather have? Years of steady, if occasionally strained devotion, covenant, Or something that looks a little bit like the Iraqi city of Fallujah, cratered with spent artillery. Consumer. From where I stand now, 
it all just looks like a cheap hotel room. And despite the sex and the excitement and the drama and the fix of everyone's empathetic attention, there's no view from this room that is worth having. Again, the culture around us beginning to stumble on the truth that God's design for marriage is strong. But you know it's just as strong? The enemy's attack against marriage. Sex in our culture, and some of the examples I've given, some of the things I've been speaking to, is exactly what the enemy wants. He has worked in that woman's life to create an incredible amount of pain and isolation and loneliness to steal, kill, and destroy from her the life that God had for her. We should pray for her. We should pray for others like her. And maybe that's even ourselves. You see, the enemy, that's his plan. To use something beautiful and wonderful that God created and make it a source of pain and guilt and condemnation and loneliness and isolation in our life to the point where we throw up our hands and we give up. Lewis, again, here is really helpful. In the screw tape letters, you know, it's this head demon screw tape writing to a, a younger demon wormwood telling him how to tempt Christians. And here's one of his lines. He says, all we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy, God, has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden. Sex is God's design and the enemy's design is to use it against us. Church, I want to tell you, when we allow that, we give the enemy power. We do. We give him an incredible amount of power. Jesus tells us there's a way to not give him a power. What does Jesus say? He says, if your eye is going to cause you to sin, pluck it out and get rid of it. And he says, if your arm's going to cause you to sin, chop it off and get rid of it. I mean, what are we supposed to be? I mean, seriously, I was in college once. I'd be blind and I would have nothing left. Seriously. I'm sure it's just me. What's the point of what Jesus is saying? He's saying do something drastic. Build a wall. Put up the barriers. Come up with a plan and execute the plan. Married or not, you got to have one. And if you don't execute that plan, you'll execute your marriage. That's what God teaches us, whether it's in the future or it's right now. The best way to have a marriage, a great marriage, tomorrow is to flee today, flee from even a hint. So what are you to do? Same answer as the rest of the Elephant in the Room series. Two things we're asking you to do at the end of this sermon. Number one, pray for God to do something. Maybe that's in your life. Maybe that's in your marriage. Maybe that's in the culture. And then search your own heart. Church, I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care how far off in the picture marriage is for you. I don't care if you want to be single for the rest of your life or you've been married longer than you care to remember. There's something from God's scripture that needs to sink into our hearts on this matter. Now, wherever you're worshiping, what's going to happen next is the bands are going to begin to come out. That's going to happen here at the Wexford campus as well. And I'd like everybody to stand up. Wherever you're worshiping as those bands are coming out, go ahead and stand up with me, please. We're going to create a moment for you to be able to respond. And here's why. I I realize that in any of the rooms, any of the sanctuaries, wherever you're worshiping today, that some of us feel like we've made some mistakes. And maybe those mistakes are in the past, and maybe we're in the midst of those mistakes now. And we want to give you a moment to just really confess, to spend some time hearing from the Lord what his heart is for you. And what kind of posture you can have so that he can bring healing and wholeness here. Remember what we've been talking about throughout this series. When we've been talking about the person that has baggage, we want you to understand. If you're struggling with this issue and you somehow right now are thinking we're condemning you, you're wrong. We're not. Condemnation is not coming from me. Condemnation is not coming from God. Condemnation is a tool of the enemy. Remember, he's subverting God's design And he's deceiving us. 
Paul tells us in Romans, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So right now, we're going to focus in on the person of Jesus Christ. Have a moment of confession, prayer, whatever you need to do. You can sing the song. You can stand quietly and worship through it and just present your heart to the Lord. And I want to leave you with this scripture, though, right before I pray. Psalm 146.8 says this, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Maybe that's happened today. Maybe you heard a scripture today that just opened your eye to something. The Lord, listen, lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. The beauty is that the righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. It's not our own. Ours is filthy. His is pure and spotless. And so during this song, we just want you to experience Jesus Christ, his forgiveness, his grace, his compassion, and his love. Let me pray, and then your team will lead you wherever you're worshiping today. Father, we come before you. We present to you who we are. You know what we're struggling with. You know the sins in these areas. You know our tendencies. You know our, uh, our desire to be pure, our desire to walk in your ways. But, Lord, some of us are just struggling deeply here. So, Lord, would you meet us with your incredible love and compassion, the same love and compassion that did not condemn a woman caught in adultery, but lifted her eyes to yours and extended to her mercy and grace and forgiveness. So, Father, may we all experience that glance right now in Jesus' name.